Welcome to part 3, the last part of this section. This part is all about educational terminology. I will talk about the meaning of the terms key competencies, something sometimes called life skills, learning objectives, learning outcomes and qualification. But I want to start with a deeper exploration into andragogy, because I think it is important. In section 1 I mentioned the origins of the word pedagogy and andragogy. And I told you the term andragogy was coined in 1833 by the German high school teacher Alexander Kapp. In the previous part I explained some of the typical traits of andragogy and how it differs from pedagogy today. But how did it evolve and get to where it is today? Wikipedia tells us the following of Alexander Kapp. He lived 1799 to 1869. He was a German educator and editor, who in 1833 introduced the term andragogy. Now, let us have a quick glance at the period, the beginning of the 19th century. It was a time when Napoleon Bonaparte had just died, as had Thomas Jefferson, the principal author of the American Declaration of Independence. Abraham Lincoln was still a young man, not yet president. Simon Bolivar had just died in 1830. By then he had led several Latin American countries, Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, to independence from the Spanish monarchy and he was nicknamed the Liberator. Famous authors of the day include Charles Dickens, Karl Marx and Victor Hugo. Charles Darwin was still a young man, having just started his 20 years of collecting evidence for what would later become his famous theory of evolution. Now, it would be nice to say andragogy has grown and thrived since it first appeared as an idea in 1833. I mean, we all like to have a respectable amount of history to back us up. But to be frank, Andragogy remained rather dormant for quite some time. Yes, Alexander Kapp coined the term, but only when others came after him and expanded on its meanings, ideas and scope do we see the development of what we today would recognize as andragogy. Back in his day, he used andragogy to describe elements of Plato's education theory. In short, Plato regards education as a means to achieve individual and social justice. According to Plato, individual justice can be obtained when each individual develops his or her ability to the fullest. Andragogy was then popularized by folks like another German, Eugene Rogenstock Uesi. Eugene writes, Andragogy is therefore the name under which we can summarize all school-based adult education. The emergence of andragogy is significant as a departure from mere pedagogy and mere demagogy. But maybe his main contribution was the fact that he managed to stir interest among other educators. Two American educators, Malcolm Knowles and Jack Mesiro, for example, expanded the theory significantly. Knowles presented his view through a learning theory. The learning theory for the first time described perhaps the desire of adults to become and to express themselves as capable human beings. In the end his theory had six components. Adults need to know a reason that makes sense to them for whatever they need to learn. Adults have a deep need to be self-directing and take responsibility for themselves. Adults enter a learning activity with a quantity and quality of volume of experience that is a resource for their own and for others' learning. Adults are ready to learn when they experience a need to know or to be able to do something or perform more effectively in some aspect of their lives. Adults' orientation to learning is around life situations that are task, issue or problem-centered for which they seek solutions. Adults are motivated much more internally than externally. 
Jack Mesiro, on the other hand, developed the critical theory of adult education and learning in his own way. He laid the groundwork for a charter for andragogy with 12 core concepts. No, I will not read them all here, but I encourage you to look into the reading material for this part, as it is very interesting. Here I will only say that while Knowles looked at how and why adults learn, Mesiro thought of ways in which the learners could become more self-sufficient and less dependent on teachers. In other words, he really put the learners in the center. Are you with me this far? Good. Because now it is time to look in detail at some central terms. These are some words you are likely to stumble upon when you read policy papers, curriculums, strategies, visions, maybe legal texts related to learning. They are for the most part general in scope, meaning they are not limited to adult learning or education only. Learning outcomes. Learning outcomes are, are defined as statements of what a learner knows, understands, and is able to do, having completed the learning process. These statements are defined in terms of knowledge, skills, and competence. Learning outcomes gives us a clear and transparent picture of the competences obtained after completing a given program or learning. They make it possible to compare, validate and transfer qualifications between different educational institutions. When we work with describing learning outcomes this way, we also help create a standard of qualifications. This in turn helps us in the process of recognizing and evalu evaluating non-formal and informal learning. By doing so, we help our learners onto the path of learning, because we have been able to describe clearly what competences they have gained and how they have gained them. Learning objective. A learning objective is a statement of what students will be able to do when they have completed instruction. Learning objectives are related to intended outcomes, not processes specific and measurable, not broad and intangible. Concerned with adult students, not trainers or educators. Learning objectives generally include performance or behavior. What is the learner expected to be able to do or produce? This reflects competences that will be learned in terms of performance. Performances and behaviors should be overt, observable, and measurable. Conditions. How will the competency or knowledge be demonstrated? This may include the specific information the learner should use or listing the tools, references, or aids that will be available to the student in demonstrating accomplishment of the objective. Criterion or degree. What specific set of criteria must be met to demonstrate mastery? This signifies a level of performance. When you write a learning objective, you need to take three steps. Include a definite, measurable verb that signifies demonstrable learning outcomes. Make sure that each objective contains an intended performance or behavior, conditions for demonstrating competence, and a criterion or degree of performance. Strive for higher order thinking, analysis, th synthesis, and evaluation levels when you can. Use, for example, Bloom's taxonomy of writing learning objectives. Learning outcomes are wider in scope and is based on the learner. Learner object learning objectives is specific and based on the activity to perform. Of these two approaches, learning outcomes is the more versatile and useful. Be careful here. As you can hear, learning objectives and learning outcomes are two different concepts that sound almost the same. So again, what is the difference? 
Learning objectives are focused on what the educator should teach the students, while learning outcomes are focused on what the student have learned at the end of the process of education. Learning objectives are goal-oriented, and learning outcomes are result-oriented. Learning outcomes usually can be easily evaluated, which is to say measured. A basic intention of adult teaching and learning is to change the focus of education from the educator to his or her students rather than the objectives of the educator. Thus we look at the outcomes. If you read a text and you are unsure about whether it talks about a learning objective or a learning outcome, remember that learning objectives are usually described with verb nouns like preparing, directing, guiding, and learning outcomes are usually described with active verbs, is capable, can conduct, and so on. Competences. A competence is the proven ability to use knowledge, skills, and personal, social, and or methodological abilities in work, learning, and in professional and personal development. A good framework to look at here is the European Qualifications Framework. Here, competence is described in terms of responsibility and autonomy. So, what competences do we need as humans? The European Commission has helped us here by describing eight key competences for lifelong learning. They are usually considered as necessary building blocks for personal fulfillment and development, social inclusion, active citizenship and uh, employment. Even though there are eight of them, that is rather many, and they are all complex, I will try briefly to explain them here, as I think this may help you understand the levels at, we, as, at which we as adult educators should strive to work. Each of these competences include the essential knowledge, skills and attitudes that you need. The key competences then are Communication in the mother tongue. This is the ability to express and interpret concepts, thoughts, feelings, facts and opinions in both oral and written form, so listening, speaking, reading and writing, and to interact linguistically in an appropriate and creative way in a full range of societal and cultural contexts. Communication in foreign languages. This includes the main skills dimensions of communications in the mother tongue I just mentioned, and also mediation and intercultural understanding. The level of proficiency depends on several factors and the capacity for listening, speaking, reading and writing. Mathematical competence and basic competences in science and technology. Mathematical competence is the ability to develop and apply mathematical thinking in order to solve a range of problems in everyday situations with an emphasis on process, activity and knowledge. Basic competences in science and technology refer to the mastery, use and application of knowledge and methodologies that explain the natural world. These also involve an understanding of the changes caused by human activity and the responsibility of us each as individuals and citizens. Having a digital competence means you are confident and critical when using information society technology, IST. This requires basic skills in information and communication technology, ICT. Learning to learn is you may be guessing, related to learning. This key skill is the ability to pursue and organize your own learning, either individually or in groups. It is based on your individual needs and requires an awareness of methods and opportunities at your disposal. Social and civic competences. Social competence refers to personal, interpersonal and intercultural competence and all forms of behavior that equip individuals to participate in an effective and constructive way in social and working life. It is linked to personal and social well-being. 
an understanding of codes of conduct and customs in the different environments where you will operate is also essential. Civic competence and particularly knowledge of social and political con concepts and structures like democracy, justice, equality, citizenship and civil rights allows you to engage in active and democratic participation in society. Sense of initiative and entrepreneurship is the ability to turn ideas into action. It involves creation, creativity, innovation and risk-taking, as well as the ability to plan and manage projects in order to achieve your objectives. You are aware of the context of your work and you are able to seize opportunities that arise. This is the foundation for acquiring more specific skills and knowledge needed by those establishing or contributing to social and commercial activities. This should also include an awareness of ethical values and to promote good governance. Cultural awareness and expression is appreciating the importance of the creative expression of ideas, experiences and emotions in, for example, music, performing arts, literature and the visual arts. Now, these eight key competences are all interdependent, meaning they are depending on each other. They create a whole bigger than the individual parts. The emphasis in all eight is on critical thinking, creativity, initiative, problem solving, risk assessment, decision taking and the constructive management of feelings. Now, key competences are transcurricular and they cannot be connected with some certain subjects or modules only. Rather, you need to have them integrated in every module and or subject that you are teaching. Qualification. According to the European Council recommendations for developing a European qualifications framework, we are talking about the formal outcome of an assessment and validation process, which is obtained when a competent body determines that an individual has achieved learning outcomes to certain given standards. Qualifications is then a formal term for a set of competences at a certain level, extent, profile and quality. It is proved with a diploma or other sort of certificate awarded by an authorized institution. The level of qualification represents the complexity and achievement of the obtained competences. It has a short description of the obtained knowledge, skills and attitudes necessary for executing a certain work activity. Qualifications can be obtained through formal education programs, non-formal courses or informal learning. It should satisfy post criteria for verification of qualifications. It should consist of measurable learning outcomes. It should be subject for evaluation with an assured quality and to lead towards a diploma or a certificate. Now for the last term. A diploma or other forms of certificate is a formal document that represents the value of learning outcomes on the labour market and or in education and training. There! This was a mouthful, except maybe for the last one, which was shorter, right? But now you have a deeper understanding of some key terms that you very likely will encounter in education strategies, vision papers, advocacy briefs, educational literature and public discussions on education. So, I think this gives you a good basis to delve into our next section, where I talk about adult education and policy in a national and a global context. But hey, you are now halfway through Module 1 of the Curriculum Globale. Well done! So, before you move on to Section 3, do reward yourself with something you like for having made it this far. 